welcome all to our November Buzz Pick Author event. We're thrilled to have N.K. Jemison join us to talk about her latest novel, The World We Make. Throughout the conversation, feel free to use the Q&A box to send in questions. If you have, uh, we'll have a Q&A portion towards the end with some of the questions that were already submitted during your registrations, and we'll still take a few from the Q&A box as well. Closed captioning is also available at the bottom of your screen. So apparently I'm to do an introduction. So N.K. Jemison has so many awards and accolades that if I read them all, the hour would be up and we would never hear her speak. But I wholeheartedly believe that we should give people their flowers. So if you don't know, let me tell you. She's been an instructor for the Clarion and Clarion West writing workshops, as well as led a masterclass on fantasy and science fiction writing. But why would you wanna take her class, you might ask. You wanna take her class because she is a New York Times bestselling author, who is also the first author in history to win three consecutive best novel Hugo Awards for her Broken Earth trilogy. Her work has also won or been nominated for a Nebula, Locus, and Goodread Choice Awards. In addition, she has won the British Fantasy Award. She did that in 2018. And she was also a MacArthur Fellow in 2020. There are standalone novels. There are short story collections. There are series. There's novellas. There's comics. And there's nonfiction. And some more. Jemison's most frequent themes include resistance to oppression, the inseverability of the liminal, and the coolness of blowing up stuff. I think that's kind of my favorite. She's been an advocate for the long tradition of science fiction and fantasy as political resistance and previously championed the genre as a New York Times book reviewer. And believe it or not, she has spare time. And apparently in that, she's a gamer and a gardener and a daughter, and a friend, and the proud, proud wrangler of a couple of cats who keep her very, very busy. Let's welcome N.K. Jemison. Uh, is the thing? Okay. <laughs> uh, it was taking a minute for the uh, stop video thing to start up again. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm fantastic, how are you? I'm good. I'm admiring the heck out of your glasses, actually. Because uh, oh, I need to buy you. a new pair and I'm looking at frames right now. So well, these are the 50-year-old special, which what? means they've got the reading at the bottom. Oh, oh, okay. And the distance at the top. So. Well, I'm 50. I, I can do that. <laughs> so. Man, I'm feeling this 50. Um, okay. so I, I wanted something a little bit extra. So uh the big glasses is where I headed. So Gotcha. And I love that you're 52. That makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, we in the 50 club now. <laughs> so whoo, it's solidarity. Cool. <laughs> What'd you say? It's kind of a cool club, isn't it? It's cool until my knee hurts. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah so. there's that. There's that. But I'm like, yeah. Uh, when when people were telling me about turning 50 and, and living my life, this this whole world is not what I was expecting. How about you? I wasn't expecting the world. Um, I was hoping for, because all of the women that I know that turned 50 told me it was the start of the best part of their lives because they were free of a lot of earlier obligations that younger people have to deal with. They finally had some money, you know, things were, were actually finally starting to look up for them. So I was looking forward to that, not in all this, but, but I was looking forward to that. Do you think that it helps um, that you had that kind of uh, start when all this world did what it did? Some. Um, I think it would be a lot harder to deal with if I wasn't, you know, a best-selling author with like a thriving career because I'd be a lot more scared, um, you know, yeah. and, and just a few years ago I would have been in that place. But yeah, you know, I mean, I do what I can now to try and like speak and, and help folks and things like that. And I'm able to help my friends and family. So yeah. that's a good position to be in, I guess. Yeah. Um, I just wish that we didn't have to deal with this. I wish I could enjoy it and just, you know, get into it. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that that's a whole that's a different conversation. That's a different conversation. <laughs> but you see, I am feeling you so very much right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, and what yeah. I will say is. 
Um, I too am glad that you are a best-selling award-winning author because I do mm-hmm. believe that the arts, all mm-hmm. of them, mm-hmm. um, especially literature for, for someone like me, helps people through mm-hmm. uh, some of the things that we are going through. Um, mm-hmm. The City We Became came out in March 2020. This one came out earlier this month. Um, and I know they started out as a trilogy, but they ended up being a duology. How did that happen? Well, that was because of all of the everything. Um, you know, I've I've talked about this in other interviews and things, mm-hmm. but uh, basically what it came down to was I originally had a plan for three books. Um, mm-hmm. The second book would have featured the city of New York bracing itself and fighting against a a president who decided to attack the city and uh, vilify it to the whole country as an example of everything that's wrong with the world in order to advance his own political power. And uh, shortly after I broke ground on book two, Trump actually did that. So um, at that point, I, I got upset because it was sort of like, well, you know, I can't write fast enough to keep up with the pace of politics right now, especially with like the utter chaos of of politics when Trump was in in the presidency. Um, And I'm gonna be unabashed about the fact that I do not like this man. So, you know, if any of y'all watching have a problem with that, bye. Um, But anyway, um, you know, so trying to write through that chaos was impossible, you know, I mean, and and I mentioned this in, in the author's note of uh, book two as well, but basically the New York that I was trying to write about was literally changing out from under me, and there was no way I was going to be able to keep up with it. So um, I basically discarded the plot that would have been the second book, uh, moved forward a plot that I had originally intended to be the third book, um, and, you know, sort of compressed all of it to, to make it wrap up in two books. Um, talk to Orbit about whether this would be my publisher about whether this would be acceptable. Um, They said, sure. Um, You know, they didn't want me working on anything I didn't want to work on. I didn't think I had two more books in me, but I did have one more. So, Um, and I like that. I, I felt better by the end of book two. So I left a couple of breadcrumbs in place that I could pursue if ever I decide to, to write the third book. Um, so if I'm ever feeling the urge to come back to this world, I can do so. There's a really obvious uh, plot element that people who've read the book will probably recognize yeah. um, that I could pursue. Um, but for that. now, I'm done. I do. I love that. And I appreciate you being candid with us. And I apologize in advance if I might ask questions you've already answered mm. in other places, but no, no, I'm no, just it's trying fine. to cover all the people who might not know how important you are and how fantastic you are. And <laughs> we're you. trying to get them. We're Thank trying you. to get them because you got some good stuff. Mm. Um, I appreciate that you were writing about the soul of the cities. Mm. Um which of course made me think about like, what is the soul of the cities that I've been (laughs) in and and how they've changed. And I'm kind of like you where I am. There is a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a very different place than when I, where I started Mm -hmm. and, you know, reading some of your book kind of helped me process Mm -hmm. and cope with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I know part of your background is in psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you feel some of that kind of seeps into some of your writing? Oh, all of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't unsee it. You know, it's yeah. like, it's like doctors who, you know, are able to sort of constantly see people and sort of instantly recognize things because they've seen it so much or they've heard enough about it or they've studied enough about it. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it, it it impacts how I handle character, I think, more than anything else. Yeah. Um, it's beginning to impact how I perceive uh, large systems of people and their their tendencies to behave. So I guess we're uh, edging into sociology, which I didn't study. Um, it's just that, you know, you do enough psychology and you start to realize how people are individually is not the same as how they are in the aggregate. Um, so it does impact a lot. Um, probably as much, though, as me reading history, because I'm just a fan of reading history books just for fun. Um, and, and when you do start to recognize those cycles and those patterns, then, you know, that also leads into it. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I found myself reading a lot more history than I normally would, because I just, I needed some help. I was like, I need something to help me 
explain some of this. Um, and I found it helpful, but then there's the the added benefit of climate change that I was like, oh wait, mm-hmm. we we didn't really do that. But another mm-hmm. aspect of history that I thought was really interesting, your name and your books are often associated with Afrofuturism. Oh. And it's been really interesting how many people's like, wow, what is this new thing? And I'm like, <laughs> it's not really new. <laughs> no. Where you been? <laughs> and, and, and so that's the thing. So just for, for the audience who may or may not know that it's not a new thing, can you mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about your definition around Afrofuturism and, and how you could be associated with the movement? Well, Afrofuturism is older than both of us, uh, those of us in the 50 Club. Um, so <laughs> Afrofuturism has been around since at least the 60s um, and uh, took the form when I was a child, mostly of music and film. Um, so Sun Ra's orchestra, um, mm-hmm. Parliament Funkadelic, uh, movies like The Brother from Another Planet, uh, stuff like that. So that, when I was growing up, was the the Afrofuturism that was already out there. Um, and Afrofuturism is just nothing more than than the radical imagining that people of color, specifically Black people, will exist in the future and will have lives that are worth exploring in the future, just as we do right now. Um, But since popular media, um, especially back in the 60s, popular media had a nasty habit of pretending that we didn't exist then, let alone in the future, um, then there is something genuinely radical about simply thinking about the, the presence of a group of people that is so maligned by society in the future, in those either terrible or beautiful worlds that that we will uh, eventually see. Um, And Afrofuturism does tend to focus on the beautiful worlds, um, but I think there is more exploration of, you know, kind of what will happen in the future in a more realistic way, um, or just in a, in a, not alighting the existence of racism and uh, other forms of bigotry and not alighting the fact that that will still exist. Um, just talking about the fact that we will win, we will succeed, we will continue to fight. Um, so nowadays, Afrofuturism is more widespread throughout media. Uh, it's not just music, although it is still happening in music. Um, I have talked in many places about my enduring admiration for, um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, why am I drawing a blank on her name? That is terrible. I have not had enough coffee. Uh, she is one of my favorite musicians too. And Janelle I- Janelle Monet. Janelle Monet. my God, wow. <laughs> okay. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, my mother used to call these junior moments. Um, <laughs> when, when you are, you know, below a certain age, you can't call them senior moments yet. Right. They're junior moments for now. Um, so, so I will eventually grow up into senior moments, but I'm for now it's just junior. Um, but anyway, Janelle Monet is a great example of, of it still happening in music. Um, but now we're seeing a lot more fiction, uh, Octavia Butler kind of broke ground there, uh, opening the door. Uh, there, there were other Black writers, uh, contemporaries of hers. Uh, Sam Delaney was actually kind of the first to start getting published, um, but Butler sort of took it mainstream, um, or it went mainstream, honestly, more after she passed than before she did. Yeah. Um, but uh, these days, Octavia Butler is on college syllabi, uh, high school syllabi. Um, it's a little rough for high schoolers, but okay. Um, and, you know, so that kind of turned the literary world's attention to uh, the the things that Black writers were doing. Um, I do not honestly consider myself an Afrofuturist writer. Um, A, because I'm writing fantasy, um, and Afrofuturism was traditionally more the realm of science fiction. Um, But on top of that, Afrofuturism is, to me, still about the aesthetic, Mm-hmm. Um, and still about, uh, you know, kind of a certain feeling, which I'm not really trying for. Maybe I'm going there anyway, and people keep listing me as Afrofuturism because they're seeing something and I'm too close to it to see it. Yeah. Um, but there's that. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of my favorite musicians is Flying Lotus, and it is just mm-hmm. magnificent. Um, mm-hmm. But it's interesting that you said that, you um, not too long ago, there was a thread on the internet where people were asking, what's the difference between fantasy and science fiction? 
How hmm. would you describe the difference? Oh, I saw that. And is there, is there any overlapping? I mean, there. I am the wrong person to ask about this. I find the division and the sort of weird, almost cultish um, enforcement of boundaries between those divisions. I am irritated by their existence. They don't make sense. The, the Science fiction and fantasy were separated uh, at the marketing level um, years and years ago when booksellers needed a better way to sell that speculative stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So they separated into fantasy, into science fiction, into horror, all those other things. Mm -hmm. And the overlap has always been fairly strong. Um, the, the distance between those is an artificially created distance um, maintained by people who kind of feel the need to kind of shape a clubhouse around themselves, I think. Um, so I don't have any patience for it. Um, I go with speculative fiction because it's a good catch-all term. Um, I often will deliberately just kind of mess with people's conceptions of what is science fiction and fantasy because I am so annoyed by the existence of that, that attempt to separate what is one big thing. Um, so I don't, I, I saw that thread and I also saw the, the most humorous responses to it were the people who were like, this is corny, yeah. um, you know, so I, I'm with the, this is corny people. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of there with you, but I also feel like I'm corny. So it's a good spot. To be, you know, it well, is welcome to the corny club too. Then. All right. So, <laughs> so, um, I, I'm, I'm interested about kind of exploring the, the whole gatekeeping because mm -hmm. your world building is epic, regardless of, you. of where you want to put it or, or what other people want to label it. Mm -hmm. And I've read speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, whatever, any for all of it for mm -hmm. a long time. But um, I, I'll be perfectly honest, in the past, I've often found myself lost in some of those places or maybe felt like I wasn't wanted in mm. some of those places um mm. but your worlds feel different to me mm. they feel like i could be there mm. like you're saying they feel you attainable. don't want to be feel... there in most of my fiction but sure yeah nobody somebody asked me once which one of your worlds would you want to live in and i was like are you did you read my <laughs> no i don't want to be in any of them no yeah. no i don't even really want to be in a living new york uh, <laughs> with the the city we became because that means at some point random tentacle monsters might show up no i don't want to live in any of my worlds. yeah I'm, I'm not here for the tentacle monsters I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm there um but you know there are some aspects to some of your stories that i do think um i would enjoy and oh, okay. the fact that people can feel welcome, more people feel welcome. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think that's easy. And to be perfectly honest, as I prepared for this, I looked at some of the questions. Well, actually, I looked at all the questions that came through, and there were several overarching themes mm -hmm. um, that audience members wanted to talk about. And one of them was your ability to world build, mm -hmm. um, because so many people felt seen or included, oh. even if it's scary. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right um how how did you I don't want to say how did you get there because that's that's a weird question but it's more were you aware that you were making this space for so many people I primarily write what I want to read so and and I send it out there in the hopes that other people might want to read it too but for the most part I'm not really interested in doing what other people expect of me or want of me. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's not out of any kind of bravado. It's just, that's what I want to read. I'm tired of reading the same old, same old. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, it was imperative to to build worlds in ways that made sense, given the histories that I've read, given like my understanding of human nature uh, to the degree that anyone can, um, you know, given the, you know, something as simple as depicting the world as it really is, or depicting people as they really are, is what's important to me. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not trying to do anything kind of I don't know, groundbreaking or whatever, I guess it just feels to me like fixing something that's broken. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting very nebulous. Um, but an example is with, with the city we became and the world we make. Um, I was speaking specifically to like the friends 
appearance of New York or the the girl's depiction of New York, um, you know, Seinfeld's depiction of New York, right. which is so common in in American television. It's just that that's not the New York that I lived in. There's mm-hmm. never been the New York I've lived in. Right. Um, and, you know, worlds that are almost exclusively white, almost entirely young, uh, you know, health, I don't even know what to call this, but young people who are conventionally attractive, uh, who all live in nice apartments and never have to worry about like, you know, rats or the rent or whatever, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that's right. not the New York I know. Right. So I just literally wanted to show reality uh, right. in my fantasy. <laughs> um, so, you know, for me, it kind of boils down to there are things that I will I will mess with and play with in in fantasy and science fiction, like the existence of magic, uh, or, or, you know, sort of the, the ground rules for the world. Um, but if I'm depicting human beings, I want that to be real humanity. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's basically it. Yeah. And you see that you, you'd see, and I love, it's a balance is a weird word. It's an ebb and flow, right. Mm -hmm. Of people coming together to Mm -hmm. do great things and people allowing a great evil to, Mm -hmm flow with them which we see mm. here you see some complacency that you're like well do you not see this coming why are you not running <laughs> yeah, um i yeah. love how exactly what you're saying there's your characters are so varied different mm. backgrounds um but they're coming together and using their unique skills their mm. unique abilities that are based on these new unique places that they are mm. because what would happen if the world was just homogenous mm. like that is that feels a little more scary to me but well, yet people are so afraid of differences well that's why i made that the bad guy in, <laughs> in these books i mean so. i was gonna let you i mean i was, I mean, yeah, it was, it was it's right there though um it so yeah, i mean would it really it, it's just I, I am writing allegories and metaphors. That is what fantasy has always been, al- allegories and metaphors. You know, I mean, there, there are the people out there that literally just, you know, fictionalize their latest D&D session. Um, but for the most part, the existence of fantasy is a way to engage with the world as it is and how it has been in the past. Um, that is the point. The the point of science fiction is to engage with the world as it is. So, you know, people think of science fiction as being about the future. No, it's really about the present. The same thing applies to fantasy. Um, And when you see fantasies that seem to be, you know, kind of weirdly set in these weird worlds where there aren't very many women, um, there are no children, no old people. It's all just, you know, strapping young men with swords, bashing each other with them, um, you know, and maybe a dragon. Um, it, I'm sorry, that's terrible. There are no books that bad that are getting published. That That is just me being facetious. But if that's all that you are seeing in fantasy, then that is that is a strange, that is that person's particular fantasy of what they would like to see or what they have seen of the world, what they have noticed of the world. Um, they don't pay attention to the women is what I take from worlds where you don't see the women. They don't pay attention to the children. They don't pay attention to the old people. They don't notice the actual diversity that exists around them. And I can't ignore that. I am part of that diversity that typically gets ignored I try to see myself and others who are like me so anyway no I I'm with you I um and that's why I said what I said about oftentimes seeing these worlds and like Mm. this isn't it and Mm. then I would move on this isn't it and then I would move on Mm. um in the past I I've done some study and some work and some reading of authors like Sherry Tepper mm-hmm. or Robin McKinley's Blue Sword. I actually taught to a, a mm-hmm. high school class because it's just mm-hmm. a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and I it was the book. first time a lot of the kids were introduced to women mm-hmm. as the mm-hmm. protagonists with mm-hmm. a sword um, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. or being the keepers of the magic. Mm-hmm. And I think those views are so important to share and to show, not just for the people who have been underrepresented, but for everybody else to remind them that the world is a bigger, broader place and we mm-hmm. all have space in yeah. it. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. that is, that should be a given, but it should be. unfortunately it isn't. So, you know, like I said, I write what I want to see um, and frequently what I haven't seen enough of. So mm-hmm. I'm glad that other people can enjoy it too. Yeah. So in, in this duology, there's, there's the humans and the avatars and the darkness and the place, the place itself. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're thinking of this world, how did you, how were you able to kind of navigate between what is already there and what could possibly be slightly different? Uh, I mean, I don't really know how to explain that. Um, it, It is part of the, the weirdness of the artist's brain, I think. Um, You know, sometimes you just look at a thing that is perfectly normal, perfectly mundane, and Mm -hmm. you see something weird. Um, You know, so, and I can't explain that. I think it just, it's part of, you know, it just comes with that kind of, that kind of thought process. Um, You know, one of the inspirations for this novel was something as simple as me walking down the street in my old neighborhood. I've moved since then. Um, but you know, I remember it was a summer day, uh, the, the sun was setting, um, the light was coming off the windows of the buildings in just a particular kind of tone and color. Um, some kids across the street had popped the water plug on, uh, I'm sorry, had opened up a fire hydrant. Um, and I, you know, but not everybody, um, I got to speak for people that are not familiar with, you know, New York's water plug culture, (laughs) um, but, um, (laughs) You know, there there were some kids across the street that had opened up the fire hydrant and they had one of those little limiters on it to keep it from using up all the water. Um, And they were playing in the water and there were little rainbows everywhere. And it was just this moment Mm -hmm. of sort of perfect New Yorkness. Yeah. And I just kind of stopped and just took it in and was like, this is a moment when the city is is recognizing itself and loving itself. And I should appreciate that. Yeah. That is that is crazy talk that is there's nothing rational happening there yeah but i think it is meaningful um you know i i should not say crazy talk i apologize for using that word um it is it is artist talk Mm -hmm. um and having that moment taking that moment to just stop and take in the surroundings um makes it strange even just the act of doing so tends to make uh, the, the mundane turn into strangeness. So I literally just write that down. I love that so much. Um, when you were talking, one of the scenes in, in one of the books that just always comes back to me is um, someone is having an episode and there's an older man um, trying to offer him a banana. Because you will feel better if you have a banana. Because that's New York. <laughs> Your blood sugar must be down. You hungry? And in my heart, like I can see that. And I'm I'm not from New York. I've Uh only ever been to New York to visit. Mm -hmm. But yet I knew that old guy. Mm -hmm. I knew him. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I could see him in all of his kindness. He doesn't know what's going on. It's Mm -hmm. not making any sense. It must be blood sugar. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much. I mean, a lot of the little interactions that I put into the book are fictionalized versions of stuff that's actually happened to me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's a banana guy for real. There are actual banana people everywhere in New York and, you know, whatever the hell is going on, you know, fire explosions, <laughs> snowstorm, blizzard, somebody is going to offer you some kind of food because they're like, well, I can't fix whatever's wrong with you, but maybe you can at least not be angry while right. you're dealing with it. Right. <laughs> um, so that is one of the things that I, that always strikes me as unique about New York. Um, yeah. And it shouldn't. There, there are kind people everywhere. I have lived in, uh, you know, the, the coldest and least friendly cities that I've ever lived in have always had their moments of kindness and beauty. Um, so I don't want to make it sound like that is something unusual for New York. It yeah. is, though, very much a part of the culture. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a given that if you are walking around in New York and you look lost, you don't even have to ask anybody for directions. If you just are walking around looking touristy enough, <laughs> somebody will stop and be like, where are you trying to get to? You know, I mean, or uh, if you ask somebody for directions, they will actually like, in some cases, walk you there. Yeah. Um, so 
and this is, I, I came to New York after living in Boston for eight years. Mm-hmm. And Boston's culture is slightly different. There were several occasions where I asked people for directions there and they looked at me like, why are you bothering to ask me? You mm-hmm. figure it out. If you have mm-hmm. to ask, you don't need to know. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like that was, yeah. Yeah. now that was my own personal experience of Boston. Of course, there were many people out there who probably have had much better experiences of Boston. Yeah. Um, but it ended up being the way that I sort of quickly characterized both cities. I've lived in New York on and off all my life, so I was familiar with it already. Boston, I didn't know about before I moved there. Um, And I had a great job and I loved that job. So I stayed for longer than I probably should have in a city where I did not feel welcome. And then in 2007, I finally decided, you know, I've wanted to live in New York my whole life. It's time to bite that bullet. I really want to be a writer. I think New York is a better place to do that from than Boston. So I moved to New York. Also, my father's here. Um, And so I moved to New York and almost immediately, like I started noticing those, those cultural differences, Mm -hmm. something as simple as, uh, you know, in Boston, um, I remember my very first Thanksgiving there. Uh, I didn't have any friends or family in the area. I had started making friends, but we weren't really there yet. Um, So I was, you know, sad in the office. I couldn't afford to go home for Thanksgiving. Um, And I'm sitting around the office moping. And I I finally said out loud to to a couple of my coworkers, I don't have anywhere to go for Thanksgiving. And, you know, I don't have anybody here. And I guess I'll try and figure out how to make a turkey leg. Very, very sad. Many violins. Um, And, you know, I'm also partly from the South. So like where I come from in Mobile, Alabama, somebody would have invited you to their house. You would have had a bajillion invitations to Thanksgiving. In New York, you would have had a bajillion invitations to Thanksgiving. In Boston, people were like, oh, that's really sad. Do, 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 do. Oh, wow. You know, so, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. So I had that moment of like, oh, I'm not in Kansas anymore. In Kansas, <laughs> they would have fed me. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Um, so, so really, that is what kind of was one of the genesis genesis of of this duology was those experiences living in different cities and realizing yeah. that there are distinct cultural differences. Yes. So, yeah, like I said, as soon as I started, that's you know the first thought. I'm from Cincinnati. What's the soul of Cincinnati? Now I live in Nashville. What's the soul of Nashville? Has that soul? Mm-hmm. changed at its core or is it changing its core and what what is what is causing that mm-hmm. um one of the audi uh registrants uh marvis asked a question she asked or what are the challenges you face when world building a futuristic uh, vision in terms of place plot and characters that's a big old question that is a question that i did an entire uh master class to answer <laughs> which could be there's... where i was headed next but yeah, I, I, I cannot answer that question in any quick or soundbitey way right. uh the challenges are you are creating a world from scratch yeah that's the challenge right how to overcome it you can find six hours of me discussing it somewhere <laughs> so uh, well, yeah. What I I'm what I'm I hearing can't... you say that I think is pretty cool mm-hmm. is that you were very specific about uh New York and you've mm-hmm. been very specific about your feelings of Boston. Mm-hmm. I've never been to Boston. I've been to New York a couple of times, but I know banana guy. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. something is connecting. There is a connectedness that seems to bleed through your writing. Well, I mean, and also New York is so prevalent in American media. You see Mm -hmm. it in so many movies, you see it in so many TV shows. And while I might quibble with the ways in which uh, different TV shows have chosen to depict the diversity of New York, Mm -hmm. they do tend to get the culture at least, right? So you've probably seen Banana Guy in some TV show or movie (laughs) or read it in a book. Um, But, you know, the the word is out in the world that New York is the kind of culture where people will help you. They won't necessarily be nice about it. In fact, New Yorkers <laughs> can be really horrific and obnoxious about how they choose to help you, but they will help you. Yeah. And I've lived in places where people would smile in your face and bless your heart you to death and would be so like overtly nice, but they right. were hurting you. They right. would find a way to stab you in the back. Right. So, you know, I mean, I would rather personally have the, the, 
uh, lack of niceness, but actual help as opposed to no help and friendliness. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard people characterize California that way or, or parts mm -hmm. of California that way. Um, I've never lived in California, but, uh, you know, and then there's, there's other parts of the world where they've got, you know, Minnesota nice, yada, yada, yada. Um, and there are different cultures about how to help other people. But mm -hmm. New York's culture has managed to kind of permeate our zeitgeist, I would say, yeah. enough that most people know that the banana guy will be there. The banana guy might get in your, your last nerve. He might be in your face. He might cuss you out, but he's going to give you that banana. So, <laughs> anyway. I mean, there's, there's also a cab driving lady, and I really liked mm -hmm. her too, um, yeah. which I'm like, she was fun. That'd be Uber person, maybe. I don't know. Well, well Susan, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Madison. Susan, one of uh, another person from our audience, said she loved your masterclass so she took those hours um, <laughs> great <laughs> thank you Susan <laughs> um but she wants to know is there anything that you would like to add or amend from that series uh not really because I I ended up they approached me, master, the Mastercast people approached me because I was already doing seminars on world building in various places. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had sort of broken it down, excuse me, into uh, various one hour talks that I was doing all over the place. There was one on world building. There was one on how to break in. There was one on protecting yourself online. There was one on characterization. Um, and so I combined all of those and added some additional material uh, in order to make the masterclass as rich as I could um, and, and elaborated on that. So I don't have any more elaboration left in me. <laughs> um, sorry. I like it. Yeah. Okay. How did you end up with Orbit? Uh, that was just... That was when I, when I first started trying to break in. Uh, I... Uh, have talked in a few other places about this. I, I, I always kind of preface uh, that in case people have seen me in other interviews and, you know, they think, oh, I've heard this before. It's because I talked about it before. Um, that's why. Um, but um, so when I first started trying to break in, my first novel was actually uh, The Killing Moon, um, book one of the Dreamblood uh, duology. Um, and at that time, which was like the early 2000s, uh, publishing was still kind of hesitant to publish books by Black authors. Um, of course, Octavia Butler and, and the four or five other authors um, had managed to sort of break in at that point. Um, but publishing was still kind of, eh, we don't know about all of that. Um, granted, at that point, throughout the 90s, there was the whole Black book boom. All of that was happening in mainstream fiction right. and in right. other genres like uh, uh, romance. Yeah. Um, but science fiction did not have its own version of that. Right. Um, and and what we always joked about back in those days was that there was like the plus four, plus, I'm sorry, I'm explaining it badly, uh, the plus four, four chant against diversity mm -hmm. um, or a chant against uh, uh, asking for diversity, which is that people would suddenly chant Butler, Hopkins, and Delaney and Barnes, Butler, Hopkins, and Delaney and Barnes, right. not even including, you know, the fact that there were several other authors who right. qualified right. Um, as a way of saying, well, we've got four, what, what more do you want? Um, and so when that book, uh, The Killing Moon, I sent it around to publishers, uh, many of them responded with, uh, you know, well, we, we like it, you know, it's a good book, but we're not sure who would buy it. We are not sure how to market it. Um, and there were a handful of exceptions to that. Uh, Orbit was the most positive of the, the rejections that I got at that point. Um, they, you know, but you know, rejection is part of being a writer. That's absolutely, that's, yeah, that's it's just part normal. of life. Yeah. Um, and Orbit was like, you know, we really like this, but we think that you should break in with something different. Um, and I was like, I ain't never heard nothing like that before in life. But um, so then I was like, okay, so you you want me to write a different book, basically. At that point, I was mad. And I decided to write a book about an angry brown woman going into a place of power and wrecking everything. Um, and that became the 100,000 Kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, and I sent that to Orbit and Orbit was like, yes, this is what we had in mind. We will take three. 
Uh, and at that point they were like, we would like a trilogy. And I was like, uh, and I, cause I was not expecting that. Um, and I gave them the trilogy. And then as soon as that was done, they were like, Hey, that other book of yours. Hey. Um, and so then they published the dream blood. So wow. I've stayed with orbit because they have done me right. You know, I've just been very happy with them. I love how your publisher is part of your inspiration team. That's incredible. I mean, the whole point of art is to take inspiration from the daily crap that you deal with. Um, so, <laughs> not this, it doesn't have to be crap. It can be good things too, right, like right. a beautiful moment of perfect light on, on right. a street corner in Crown Heights. Um, but it can also be the stuff that pisses you off. So, yeah. Yeah, I find that spurs me on quite a bit most days. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, are there any ways in which you have found your writing to have surprised you as time has passed all the time I mean, yeah how? every every possible way um I go back sometimes and read my older works and I'm always like kind of squinching into it because <laughs> you know artists can be the most self-critical self-destructive people in the world um and and I am often I go back and look at my old writing and I'm like oh god oh that those turns of phrase oh I could have said that much shorter you know like I'm the the inner critic won't shut off but yeah. sometimes I go back what I've discovered is that it works better if I listen to my work if I listen to the audiobook versions of my work really? um, so sometimes I will listen to uh I was listening not too long ago to uh Robin uh oh gosh why am I drawing a blank on her name my god that's terrible the woman who does my audiobooks now um and who did the audiobook uh voices for uh the city we became and so forth Robin is her first name I'm trying to remember mm -hmm. her last name because I like I listen to it but I don't remember yeah, I calling remember. her name that's my fault anyway um I'm sure I'll remember it at two in the morning that's how I always watch <laughs> Um, but uh, anyway, I was listening to her doing uh, the Broken Earth books. I was listening again to the fifth season and she got to this really tense part that was happening and I was listening to this and I kind of got lost in it. I closed my eyes and I was visualizing things and um, sort of imagining the actual events happening. Um, and then I had a moment of, wow, this is really good. I wonder what will happen next. Oh, wait. <gasps> I wrote this. Um, nice. So that does Robin Miles. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> people, someone in the chat just just put that in. I'm so sorry, Robin. It's not you. It's me. I have the world's worst memory. Um, the junior moments are, are growing into senior moments. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so uh, but yeah, listening to it takes me out of the inner editor mode. And then I can just engage with it as what I tried to do, which is the book that I wanted to read that I wasn't seeing out there. Um, but I sometimes forget things and then I forget that, oh yeah, I wrote this. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really into the turns of phrase. Oh, that's a good sentence. Oh, wait, I wrote it. So that's all the time. That, that's awesome. Well, since you were looking at the chat, did you see another question that you might um, have a moment to answer? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, the first one that I just see is it's Pop Elizabeth from, oh, hi there, uh, from Wiscon watching remotely in Memphis. Have there been any options, discussions on my first series or the current one for film or TV? Yes. Um, I will say that at this point, uh, the, we're working on, uh, the inheritance trilogy rights have sold. Mm -hmm. The Dreamblood duology rights have sold. Several of the short stories from How Long Till Black Future Month have sold. Uh, the, the Broken Earth books, obviously, uh, I, that's pinned on my Twitter, so I think everybody knows about it. But um, the Broken Earth books are, are, have sold as film rights to Sony. Uh, and I wrote the script for that. So the oh, script wow. is currently being, is we're working on that. Um, and with the city we became and the world we make, I cannot discuss it because contracts have not been signed and announcements have not been made. Okay. Um, but there has been some very, very, very good news on that front recently. So I will leave it at that. That can is discuss awesome. it, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but yes, there's lots of good news happening on, yeah. on all fronts. So we will see what happens. That now, 
Yeah, the rights don't necessarily mean that the show or the movie will actually happen. Um, in fact, several of my uh, intellectual properties have kind of bounced around a little bit. Uh, different rights holders have bought them, sat on them for a while, uh, and then either moved on or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Hollywood is does not green light many things, and that is a normal part of the process. So, I mean, I can't tell you at this point that something is definitively coming to the screen at some point mm -hmm. in the future. Sorry, that was uh, my heater. I have it on for Magpie, who is sitting next to me as we talk. All good. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so I can't give you any definitives on that at this point, um, okay. but movement is happening. And that is okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious. I know you are a champion of a lot of your writer friends. Um, what are some some books that you are excited about that are coming that people might you know, you want to share with people. I have had that same reaction to the pandemic that a lot of folks have had, which is that I have found my attention span shortening and, and changing to the degree that reading books is hard now. Um, I can do it. Uh, I am forcing myself to continue reading because reading has been my joy since I can't even remember how long. Um, but I am reading very, 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 very slowly. Um, so the only thing that I have read late that, lately that is forthcoming is uh, Martha Wells's The Witch King. Um, and yes, she is a friend. Yes, I'm also a giant Martha Wells fan girl, and I will tell everybody. <laughs> um, if you have not read the Murderbot books or the Raxora books or any of her earlier books, please yep. check those out. Um, yep. But The Witch King is a completely new book set in a new world with new protagonists. Uh -huh. um, I am happy to report that once again, it has a very powerful, very sullen, very uh, antisocial <laughs> male protagonist. Uh, for whatever reason, Martha just loves doing those kinds of characters, and the characters are just what you need to read. Um, yeah. They are, are misanthropes and frustrated people, and uh, sometimes they are struggling with anxiety like regular folks, even as they are incredible badasses. Um, yeah. But The Witch King is yet another one of those, and I am looking forward to how the world reacts to it. Well, I mean, we all struggled with some of that too, right? Mm -hmm. Just, I, you know, I've read since forever and I'm around books every day, all day, but there are those mm -hmm. wonderful things like comics. And mm -hmm. I know you have written some comics. Mm -hmm. There's those wonderful things like fan fiction <laughs> i'm not gonna talk about the fan fiction though <laughs> you don't have to talk about it i'm just saying i'm not gonna talk about the fan it's fiction. the thing um i have been reading and story. writing lots of fan I'm fiction uh i have been reading and writing lots of fan fiction because for yeah. some reason that doesn't feel the same as a book really? um yeah i have written a new short story um and that is the first one that i've written in like three years i'm revising it now and uh we'll, we'll start shopping it around and we'll see how that goes but um so i am reading and writing it is just slower than it used to be yeah. um the writing part is it seems to be bouncing back the reading part is not so much there yet um, I am listening to more podcasts and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I have been kind of catching up. I had gotten way behind on the Magnus archives, which wrapped up like two years ago. Um, so I'm finally getting to the end of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm about to restart uh, Welcome to Night Vale too, because um, whatever yeah. reason I like horror on horror and weirdness on podcasts. So I, I just like it in general. It, it just works for me. Um, I know your short story, The Red Witch, um, is one of my yeah. favorites. Well, I have, good, so uh, I have good adaptation news on that front, which I cannot discuss. <laughs> um, so, Sorry. Ooh, a moment. Well, yeah, it is multiple levels of good news. I will <gasps> just say uh, two different media. So we will we will discuss that in a different. Okay. Yeah. Once once more things have been announced publicly, I'll be able to talk about that. Well, I'll be stalking because that one. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I remember reading it like before bed and just going through it and just I just had to sit with it after hmm. it was over and was just there was so much it, it it i get that sense of magical realism right like this could actually absolutely be happening right now I mean, in this world 
the character was based on oh that's a cat hair i kept feeling something on my lips um <laughs> but um anyway um it, it was based on uh my great grandmother um known as Madea. <laughs> um but my great grandmother um basically kind of uh did a lot of herbalist healing and things like that and so you know i met her a few times as a child i didn't really get to know her thoroughly and so a lot of that is taken from uh family stories right. um and and that part of my family lived in birmingham in pratt city um and so you know that was really just me kind of processing all those family stories in through my weird writer brain um you know she was not actually a witch but yeah. Stuff. I'm not gonna go with weird. I'm gonna say your brain is glorious. Like you, you're doing you're some great very things. Kind, you are so. I'm, kind. Honestly, people who know me would never call me kind. So <laughs> just so you know. Oh well, all right then. I say what I say, <laughs> and I mean what I say. So okay, um, <laughs> okay. I will not question it again. No, my. Goodness. Um. So we're 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 getting close to the end, but I want to come back to the world we make again. What? And I know how you felt about it and, and just listening to me talk about um, how people have felt about it. Because like I said, I pulled a lot of questions that I got from the audience into some of the things that I've asked you mm-hmm. when you wrote it and when you were finishing it up, what, what did you imagine or what would you want someone to take from the book? So I would say that both the city we became and the world we make, I I consider them one story um, because they're just one story spread across two books. But um, I guess the core of it is that things are bad, but if we work together and fight back, we can continue to have the life that we need. Uh, You know, I mean, we're gonna have to fight for it. That's really the core of it. Um, I meant for it to be more uplifting. I mean, I think of the Broken Earth books as a positive message. Um, mm-hmm. People, people like it's a positive message after a whole lot of horrible things. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it is a message of love, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this case, the same, the same thing. I, mm-hmm. I, I believe that if we do not allow the chaos and monstrosity around us to defeat our ability to work together, our ability to respect each other, our ability to focus on a goal and get that goal done, then we can stand against all of the everything. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the core of it. I love that with every bit of fiber. We got to like together. We, we got to like each other, but we do have to be- but We got to work together. together. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that is true. And I, I also feel very strongly that 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 it's a love crafting issue, creature, um, give, especially knowing the history mm-hmm. of of the author, that particular author. And, you know, the the conversations you had about, you know, accepting the award that mm-hmm. was named after him. Oh and, yeah, that wasn't me. <laughs> that well, was that. yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I've spoken about the incident, but uh, yes, but, not you. Yeah, but the, me. but the, I, I feel like it's a reclaiming because for so long, I didn't always know the history behind mm-hmm. it. I read the stories with like well, that's really I. interesting. That's really interesting. Um, you know, and mm-hmm. there were he had a lot of issues with a lot of different kind of people. Mm-hmm. I will just say that. Mm-hmm. But watching authors reclaim it. Mm. and and recognize what it is without canceling mm. so to speak mm-hmm. but more mm-hmm. this is what it is we yeah. have to call it what it is so that we don't do this again so that we don't get caught up yeah and and the the incident that i i mentioned that kind of drew my attention to it and i suspect a lot of other black writers that's why there's so much mm-hmm. um, kind of anti lovecraft coming out right now right. um was uh an incident that involved Nnedi Okorafor who is yeah. a friend of mine and another black writer in science fiction and fantasy um who won the world fantasy award that yep. was lovecraft's head yep. that initiated a whole discussion yep. about craft yeah um, but what most people took from it was that Lovecraft reacted to the world around him with fear. Mm -hmm. And those of us that he was afraid of Mm -hmm. see the world in a different way. Um, And so I think all of us were were trying to do that. Yeah. 
Uh, and I think that's important. And forgive me for conflating the two. Um, it just, yeah, I did tell you about that incident. So. <laughs> uh-huh. I was like, I remember it and, and, and the things that were going back and forth. And then, of course, you know, eventually Lovecraft Country came out and then people had another kind of flow um, trying to understand what was going on. And it was so interesting to me because some people don't realize how much of our world and these Mm-hmm. speculative worlds, magical worlds, fantastic worlds, they work together or they are mm-hmm. a cause and effect of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I find that interesting, mm-hmm. especially as more arts are trying to be removed from schools, as more mm-hmm. uh, music, you know, literature, all those things. And like, do people not understand this as how people process? They don't. Um, yeah. Well, and well they don't or they don't want people to process. That is another thing. And there is that. there, there are people out there that want technology made without consideration for ethics, and yeah. so they want to get, uh, you know, courses that might help people learn critical thinking out of schools and colleges. Yeah. Um, there are people out there who want uh, technology made without regard for legalities yeah. <laughs> um, or yeah. or diversity. Um, right. You know, the, one of the things that came up in the pandemic was that. Uh, uh, blood, um, oxygen, oh gosh, why am I drawing a blank on all the words today? Um, blood oxygen devices that fit right, on the your, finger. On your finger. What the heck are those called? I don't know. Um, right. Tend not to, to get accurate readings uh, for, for Black um, uh, and darker skinned individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we see again and again at different points, what happens when right. you focus strictly on uh, science and technology without the rest of the stuff? Um, yeah. You know, and it's a waste of money and time for everybody. But yeah. you know, people continue to think, "I don't want my my tech workers to think. I don't want them to have ethics. Um, so I'm going to fire half of Twitter and then tell the tell the rest to to walk off um, if, if they aren't willing to to do unethical and inhumane things. We're yeah. not going to go too much farther into that, though. Um, so you know, I mean, it's just. You can't separate these things. You right. can try and you end right. up wasting a lot of money and time. Um, so. So this has been amazing. Oh. And I had one more comment from an audience member named uh, Kate Rice. And Kate Rice simply says, I don't have questions. No question. Just thanks. Um, <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> I thought that was just incredibly beautiful uh, way to to kind of wrap this up. Um, we are so honored to have you. Uh, I am completely, totally fangirled out. Um, I am. I mean, <laughs> but thank you. When when this opportunity presented itself, I was beside myself. I was like, "Are you kidding? Like, Aww. you just don't know." Um, and I appreciate your publisher and and people like well, we want to do something with you all. And we know Nicole really, really loves Nora. (laughs) And I'm like, yes, Nicole Uh really loves Nora. Uh Um, Because I was one of those kind of weird little girls uh, who liked, like I said, all this fantasy, all this speculative, all of the thing. I was reading, chugging the books around all the time. My father was like, honey, don't you have no friends? Don't you have no <laughs> oh, Lord. And I was God. like, no, not when I can read. Um, <laughs> a stack of books is my friend. Yeah, well. The library is my friend. Um, and so are these independent bookstores because I, I like <laughs> these people, they will talk to me about the books. And so you coming here is is a huge honor for all of us. Um so I'm gonna do my 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 alto, um, but I don't want you to leave just yet because uh, I know you are amazing. So the world we make is mm-hmm. on sale now and available at your local independent bookstore. Shopping locally makes a big difference to mm-hmm. small businesses in your community. Indie bookstores are the best. So go support them with your dollars and get a great book while we're at it. Mm-hmm. Um, again, 
we would like to thank the wonderful, brilliant N.K. Jemison, Miss Nora. Um, <laughs> we can't thank you enough for joining us this evening. Um, thank you also to Orbit Books for um, sharing Nora with us tonight. And thank you all for joining us. Um, stay with Indie Book Buzz uh, and Bookfinity for uh, each buzz pick. Uh, and readers, be sure to shop. Shop at those local indies at Christmas time um, and get a book or get three books. And again, short stories, novels, <laughs> series, um, <laughs> duologies. Miss <laughs> Nora has them. And uh, again, just thank you so much. And we appreciate you. So good night to everyone, including Miss Nora. Thank you. Good night. Bye.